Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Bill Johnson, and I represent the 6th District of Ohio. I'm very proud to be a co-chair of the UXO Demining Caucus, along with my colleague, Congresswoman Jackie Speer. Today's briefing focuses on weapons security in Latin America, addressing root causes of violence. This is a particularly important topic because, as you know, where there is human conflict, there are weapons of war that must be addressed. And the landmines, IEDs, and other explosive hazards left behind from such conflicts often leaves countries scrambling to secure and manage surplus stockpiles of weapons and ammunition that have built up over time during the conflict. These stockpiles become targets for armed criminals and extremist organizations. In Latin America, it's evident that the flow of these weapons facilitates violence and instability in the region. For example, El Salvador's civil war resulted in a large flow of weapons into the country during the 1980s and 90s. Unfortunately, now access to weapons and the spread of gang culture has left El Salvador with one of the highest rates of uh, highest murder rates in the world. Recently, a woman living in El Paraiso, El Salvador, named Maria, described the fear she feels every day under these circumstances. She said, and I quote, I have to live watching my back all the time. I have to be careful not to leave my house with anything of value that can catch the attention of the gang who lives in my neighborhood. Families should not have to live like this in fear of armed violence in their own homes and communities. So while the members of this caucus are committed to extraditing, uh, errat I'm sorry, eradicating landmines and other explosive remnants of war, it is vitally important that we also support and promote global weapons security programs that are intended to prevent these remaining weapons from falling into the wrong hands. I'm really very pleased that Congress intends to include increased funding for the State Department's conventional weapons destruction account in the fiscal year 22 budget, which will enable the US and our partners to address the various weapons of war that continue to devastate countries long after the conflict has ended. I look forward to hearing more from our esteemed panelists about the situation in Latin America and the programs in place with our partners like Halo Trust and MAG, the Mines Advisory Group. Before I introduce them though, I, uh, I believe uh, Representative Jackie Spe uh, Speer would like to say a few words. Jackie, over to you. Thank you, Bill, and uh, welcome everyone to our Congressional Demining UXO um, Caucus and to this event. Another example that Republicans and Democrats can indeed work together. As um, the Congressman mentioned, uh, we are proud that this caucus helps secure about $255 million in the House passed appropriations bill for conventional weapons destruction. And even more encouraged that the Senate outdid us and in their state and foreign ops appropriation report included 272 million. So our job now is to uh, make sure that higher number stays in. In addition to supporting the State Department's humanitarian demining programs, this important funding also supports weapons security management programs in countries around the globe. Countries experiencing armed violence often must address deadly debris of war, such as landmines, which threaten civilian lives and livelihoods. But they are often also left to secure large stockpiles of dangerous weapons, which is an often overlooked piece of post-conflict management. That's why this particular program is so critical and complementary to demining efforts. Weapons security management programs prevent weapons, ammunition, and IED precursor materials from falling into the hands of destabilizing actors. The Beirut port explosion in 2020 was an eye-opening example of how necessary this work is. There were 218 deaths, 7,000 injured, and 300,000 who were made homeless in that particular explosion. 
And since then, more and more partner countries are interested in the US government's support to secure these weapons and stockpiles. Weapon security programs are a growing part of foreign assistance, providing a significant boost to security and stability in our relations with partner countries. In Latin America, excess and poorly managed weapon pose a threat to civilian security and foster instability. We've seen how this violence contributes to the root cause of destabilizing migration. And I applaud the work that our civil servants in the State Department's Office of Weapons Removal do every day to make a real difference and support security and stability in Latin America. So um, with that, I turn it over to my co-chair, Representative Johnson, to introduce our panelists. Well, thank you, Jackie. I'm now pleased to introduce today's panelists. First, we'll hear from Juan Manuel Henao. Juan joined HALO as Senior Project Manager for the Northern Triangle in July of 2020. His previous posts include the Deputy Chief of Party and Chief of Party of several USAID and INL projects on citizen security, transparency, and democracy promotion in Venezuela, Mexico, and the Northern Triangle. Juan holds a uh, Juris Doctorate and a BA in International Relations and Political Science from the George Washington University. Next, we'll hear from Franz Sains Coles, the county, uh, the country director, I'm sorry, the country director in Ecuador uh, for the Mines Advisory Group, or MAG. Uh, Franz has been MAG's country director in Ecuador since 2020 after serving as CEO of the Public Center for Technology Transfer and also as lecturer at Universidad de las Americas. Franz holds a Master of Science in Economics from the University of Hohenheim as well as a Bachelor of Science in Economics from uh, the Pontifica Universidad Catolica del Ecuador. Franz authored a report on his MAG program entitled Women at the Forefront of Vital Weapons and Ammunition Management Work in Ecuador. And lastly, we'll hear from Karen Chandler, the Director of the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement, Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the U.S. State Department. Karen, has, uh, Karen became the Director of the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement, or WRA, in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs in September of 2021. She is responsible for policy and programs to mitigate the impact of explosive hazards and reducing the threats that at risk illicitly proliferated and irresponsibly used conventional weapons posed to international security and stability. WRA co-op uh, operates conventional weapons destruction programs valued at more than 200 million annually in across approximately 40 countries. Previously, Karen served in, uh, uh, in PM, the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, as the director of the Interagency Man Portable Air Defense Systems or MANPADS Task Force and as the PM Chief of Staff. So thank you all for joining us today. I look forward to your presentations. Let me turn it over to Juan now. Thank you, Congressman, I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if everyone can uh, see the screen here. We can go to my first slide. Uh, the following one, please. The next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry, the previous one. There you go. Thank you. Um, just <clears throat> all right. Bueno, uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. I'm Juan Inel, Hale Senior Project Manager for the Northern Triangle. Uh, foremost, I want to thank Representative Jackie Spear and Representative Bill Johnson for the invitation to this event, and especially for the opportunity to speak on an issue that is dear to my heart an issue that is central to the HALO Trust in Central America, and an issue that is both of humanitarian and strategic interest for the United States government. I also want to thank the Congress, the administration and Department of State, especially the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement in the US State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which has been financing and allowing HALO to deliver programs that help reduce the number of weapons in the streets of Central America, allowing for increased security and helping decrease the number of weapons illegally sold rented 
to commit homicides, robbery, theft, and extortion. Um, as you may know, Central America has many charms, but also many challenges. Uh, the recent COVID pandemic and ongoing numerous crises within governments, organized crime and gangs make the region's politics very complex. Structural issues and inequality also continue to plague these Central American countries, and so the reasons for regular migration are obvious. Notwithstanding, the international community continues to do its best in the region. By far the biggest donor is the United States government, who for more than 50 years has been a supporter of governments, civil society, the press, the indigenous, and the many other local actors that have sought to improve local conditions throughout. Next slide, please. HALO's work is an extension of America's interest and generosity in the region. By supporting the strategy to reduce irregular migration by supporting military and police, to prevent the illicit flow of their stockpiles from armories into the hands of gangs, cartels, and other criminal elements. The work involves close collaboration with ministers, police directors, and technical teams on a number of fronts. And this is what I want to address today. My comments uh, will focus mainly on the Northern Triangle, and HALO's recent work in the region. But before delving into the Northern Triangle, I do want to note HALO's work in Colombia, US strongest ally in the region, and the country with the most prolonged conflict in the Americas, with over 50 years of internal struggle. Next slide, please. In Colombia, the use of landmines continues to cause injury and loss of life in some of the most vulnerable societies. Since 1990, there have been more than 12,000 victims caused by landmines and other explosive devices as a result of the conflict. PMWRA has supported Colombia continuously since 2013 and continues to be HALO's principal donor. Since then, more than 800 explosive devices have been destroyed by PMWRA-funded teams. Over 600,000 square meters of hazardous land has been cleared, benefiting more than 13,000 Colombians. Through humanitarian demining activities, the U.S. Department of State is directly contributing to improving overall security levels in Colombia and considerably reducing the number of accidents caused by explosives remnants war in the country. Next slide, please. PMWRA has also played a critical role in Central America. Weapons are easy to come by in the region, as the Congressman noted. Both military and civilians still have access to weapons used during the various civil wars that took place in the region from the 50s to the 90s. Next slide, please. But by far the biggest culprits of violence in the region are gangs and organized crime who cause much of the social, political, and economic instability that force individuals to flee these countries. And these groups routinely undermine and circumvent rules to either divert, divert illicit weapons from official state stockpiles or smuggle weapons illegally through the region's porous borders. And to be clear, the choice of weapon, especially for a gang, is a pistol, a nine millimeter, or any other handheld weapon that can be concealed and used to commit homicide, extortion, theft, or kidnapping. For years, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras have had some of the highest homicide rates in the world. The majority of these homicides have been caused by weapons. In fact, eight out of 10 murders are caused by a firearm. So we can safely assume that guns drive violence that force many to migrate from the region. To put it into context, Guatemala has well over 2 million legal and illegal civilian held weapons. Honduras has an estimated 1.7 million weapons of which approximately 650,000 are illegal. And El Salvador has nearly 740,000 firearms in civilian hands of which fewer than 200,000 are registered. Another issue in the region are private security firms. Guatemala has an estimated 150,000 private security guards, five times more than its police force of 30,000 officers. The trend is obviously very similar in El Salvador and Honduras. These private security companies also have a bad habit of losing weapons. And in the case of El Salvador, 200 to 300 weapons are lost by private security firms every month and no one knows where these weapons go. Next slide, please. HALO has been doing its part to support military and police secure their weapons. It's here where HALO works in tandem with police and military commanders in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras to secure armories and explosive storehouses, to destroy confiscated and obsolete weapons, and to train police and soldiers on the key elements of stockpile management. Since 2017, HALO has worked with police and military to destroy more than 6,000 confiscated and obsolete firearms and more than 260,000 rounds of ammunition. Next slide, please. Likewise, 
Halo staff conducted 130 armory risk assessments to ensure military and police weapons are, are stored correctly and not easily available for theft. To date, more than 40 armories in the region have received security upgrades. Since 2017, HALO has also spent $230,000 to upgrade armories and explosive storehouses across El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. These upgrades are helping the military and police keep weapons from falling into the hands of intermediaries who then sell weapons to criminals, who then cause the bloodshed and chaos that drives families and youth to flee their countries. Next slide, please. In addition, HALO has trained more than 150, excuse me, 145 soldiers and police on armory management practices and provided 119 soldiers and police training on explosive ordnance disposal. These courses help professionalize members of security forces and make security professionals more proficient in the use, storage, and safekeeping of state weapons and explosives. Slide nine, please. <clears throat> HALO operates in a te technical area that is sometimes overlooked. Security forces in Central America are in need of technical support especially in the area of stockpile management. Helping police and military keep their weapons safe and secure should rank high on the list of priorities for the U.S. government and for regional governments, especially in a region where gun violence is higher than in other parts of the world. Next slide, please. However, more needs to be done, and state weapons are only one piece of the puzzle. First, the judicial system is in possession of weapons confiscated during crimes. In places like El Salvador, more than 14,000 confiscated weapons sit in military deposits without a clear idea of when or if these weapons should be destroyed. In Guatemala, more than 50,000 confiscated weapons remain in storage without clear guidance on when to destroy them. HALO is working with military police and attorney generals and the judicial system in these countries to identify and destroy eligible confiscated weapons that serve no purpose whatsoever for any legal proceeding. Second, Regional governments need support marking and tracing their weapons. Third, regional governments need weapons and ammunition management assessments to identify gaps in policies and protocols covering weapon and ammunition life cycles. This is why HALO has partnered with the United Nations Institute of Disarmament Research, UNIDIR, to conduct WAM, Weapons and Ammunition Management Baseline Assessments in El Salvador and Guatemala in 2022. Finally, Military and police need continued support via trainings and armory upgrades to ensure security forces have the correct skills and conditions to store weapons and prevent them from being lost or stolen. Uh, with that, Madam Congresswoman, Congressman, uh, that concludes my comments. And I just wanna reiterate uh, the HALO Trust gratitude for your continued support of this very important initiative in the Northern Triangle. Uh, the team and I will continue to work hard to make sure less weapons make it to the streets to cause bloodshed. We are confident that our contribution ultimately helps reduce the violence that caused many Central Americans to flee their countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, let's go to Franz next. Franz, over to you. Thanks a lot, Representative Johnson, Representative Spire. Uh, thanks to everyone for taking a couple of minutes from your agendas to hear a little bit about the successful experiences we had in Latin America with uh, PSSM related projects, which were or are funded by the US. Uh, my name is Francis Kols. I am the country director of the Mines Advisory Group for Ecuador. And I will do my best to not bore you while I go through this uh, quick presentation. Uh, the challenges that the region face are pretty much homogeneous. You have to think that Latin America, or actually by 75% of the homicides in Latin America, are related with firearms. And under that framework, one of the main source of uh, weapons and ammunition uh, for criminal groups are diverse weapons from state-held uh, stockpiles. Next slide, please. As for the programs I will present you, I will start with Ecuador. Uh, I am not starting with this country just because it's a program I know the best, but this project has something unique uh, to make a point I would really like to share with you. This next slide. Uh, this unique fact or this set of unique facts recall the context where the project was implemented. First of all, you have to consider that Ecuador was just going out of a 10 year dictatorship between 2007 and 2017, whose president did not build healthy international relations. He didn't get along well with most of the developed countries and his closest allies were mostly socialist governments. So long story short, International cooperation with 
most or of the developed countries was kind of a novelty that just restarted with the arrival of a new president back in 2017. Another fact that has to be considered is that as there were not a lot of international cooperation projects going, there was a need of re-engaging most of the national stakeholders. And you have to consider that one of the toughest sectors to negotiate is the defense sector. For instance, uh, building schools or funding humanitarian aid initiatives is something that you can normally implement without any major objection. However, convincing the defense leadership that show their bases, disclose some classified information and convince them that getting rid of some of their weapons and munitions is out of their best interest is something that demands negotiation on a deeper level. Uh, can you go to the last slide, please? The third fact that has to be considered is that this project was implemented during the COVID pandemic without any major certainty about the impact of the pandemic in the project. And the fourth uh, element that has to be considered is that Ecuador was facing a fiscal crisis, which is, of course, bad for the economy, but opens some room to implement uh, international cooperation funded projects. Next slide, please. Um, that being said, our project had uh, three pillars. It was a 2.5 million project, or initially it was a 1 million project. We got extra funding until February 2023 with uh, three pillars uh, to be implemented. The first one concerned training. The second one concerned uh, physical upgrades to enhance the security and safety levels in military depots and armories. And the third uh, pillar of the project was to help the host country to destroy obsolete weapons and munitions. So uh, what I want to state here is that normally not everyone would dare to start a project under these circumstances. However, WRA took a leap of faith, trusted our organization, and took the chance to support Ecuador, which is the most important part. And that led the US to be the first foreign country to support humanitarian security activities for the last decade. The nicest part of the project was that even this adverse context, we were able to support a reestablishment of the cooperation between the US and Ecuador and to deliver great outcomes. Within the first 15 months of the project, we were able to train more than 100 military personnel to support uh, five military bases or depots to enhance their safety and security levels through physical upgrades and to destroy about 100 tons of munition, which leads to roughly 40 tons of net explosive weight. Additionally, we were able to destroy in Ecuador around 300,000 rounds of small arms ammunitions, which are or could easily be used by criminal groups if they, if they get versed. Next slide, please. Ecuador is not the only great example that I have to show you here of US PSSM funded projects. We have Peru as well, for instance, which has been implementing WRA funded projects since 2017, helping the Peruvian forces to increase their capacity to store and manage munition. Next slide, please. So the project goals was to increase the regional security and stability by strengthening the effective management of the Peruvian security force held weapons and munition. It was, or it is actually a similar project than Ecuador, which has two goals. The first one is to provide training and mostly to help Peru to destroy their obsolete munition. Next slide, please. Under that framework, uh, through the generosity of the US support, we have been able to train 15 military personnel in weapon cutting and EOD related activities and to destroy more than 700 tons of obsolete munition, preventing pilferages and unplanned explosions as well. Next slide, please. Then I just want to briefly mention you the concept of the program we had in Mexico, which highlights some of the potential of the PSSM projects. Next slide, please. The idea in Mexico was to focus exclusively in cutting CIS weapons in order to deter the proliferation of illegal weapons that are used, sorry for the redundancy, in illegal activities. This is something that has been extrapolated as well to the Ecuadorian and Peruvian projects where we are not only helping to destroy obsolete munition from the military, but seize weapons and munitions as well. Next uh, slide, please. And I wanted to highlight this 
facts from Mexico because I have two thoughts that I would really like to share with you. The first one concerns the fact that PSSN projects are really beneficial to society. These kind of projects help to minimize the risk of uh, weapons and munition diversion, which is, as I said, one of the main sources of illegal stocks of uh, for drug traffic related groups, gangs, and other criminal associations. Additionally, these projects help to reduce the likelihood of unplanned explosions, which could devastate whole cities. What I'm trying to say here is that even if uh, humanitarian security is not the most conventional sector for international cooperation, ESSM projects really allow vulnerable population to live safer and more secure lives. Uh, I will not neglect that any kind of cooperation is always good. This is something that none of us can neglect. But believe me when I say that the amount of countries willing to fund other kind of projects is bigger than the list of countries that acknowledge the importance of PSSM and humanitarian security. And therefore, we all owe the U.S. a big thank you as that country is with no doubt a pioneer in the whole world in order to support PSSM-related activities. Next slide, please. The final thought I wanted to share with you, I will just, actually I will tell you an anecdote that will help a lot to explain better this thought I wanna share with you. Uh, remember I told you we went through a 10 year dictatorship from a president who had bad relation with pretty much all the developed countries that didn't have any socialist uh, oriented government. So well, after that regime finished in 2017 and the next president come to place, Operation restarted and this new government ended up in May 2021. Then Ecuador faced again presidential elections where there was a considerable chance that someone from the same political party as the former dictator comes into power again. So when we were close to those elections, I was having a chat with staff from the US embassy, uh, given that the elections outcome could of course influence the way that US cooperates with Ecuador. So when we were having this chat, this person from the embassy told me that they were thinking about to engage any potential president and that regardless the outcome and be, yeah, besides the sensitivity of the sector, they were thinking that this support from WRA in Ecuador was pretty much the best example they had to show experiences about successful cooperation within, in between Ecuador and the US. What I want to say here, just as stated in the slide, is that PSSM has a huge potential as well to keep international cooperation going and to highlight the great support that the U.S. is providing on a global level. That being said, I just have to thank you for your time and for your support to humanitarian security projects. Well, thank you, Franz. Uh, let's go now to uh, Karen Chandler, the Director of the Office of uh, Weapons Removal and Abatement. Karen? Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Karen Chandler and I have recently taken on a new role as the Director for the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement or WRA within the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. I previously served as the Director of the Interagency Man Portable Air Defense Systems Task Force, which is also housed within WRA. It is my honor and pleasure to participate in today's UXO caucus event. And I would like to first thank Representative Jackie Spear and Representative Bill Johnson for their continued leadership on this issue and their support of the Congressional UXO Caucus. I also want to acknowledge HALO for their continuing role in coordinating these events. The United States takes great pride in leading the world in support of conventional weapons destruction and addressing vulnerabilities in physical security and stockpile management. Today, I would like to highlight our ongoing efforts to combat this issue in Latin America and reveal how successful conventional weapons destruction and physical security and stockpile management can powerfully influence the root causes of irregular migration and promote regional stability. The United States has long been the world's largest international donor to conventional weapons destruction providing more than $4 billion to support humanitarian mine action, physical security and stockpile management, and associated activities in more than 100 countries since 1993. In Latin America and the Caribbean alone, the United States has provided more than $225 million in conventional weapons destruction assistance. 
Throughout the region, our programming strengthens the physical security and stockpile management of partner nations' weapons depots to curb pilferage and illicit trafficking of small arms and light weapons from state-held stockpiles, including weapons of particular concern like manned portable air defense systems or man pads. This programming also redu reduces the risk of catastrophic unplanned explosions at munitions storage sites, promotes regional stability and economic development, and protects the U.S. southern border. In Central America and elsewhere in the hemisphere, traffickers, criminal gangs, and terrorists use illegally obtained small arms and light weapons to advance a culture of violence and fear that threatens civilian security and contributes to the root cause of migration. These criminal activities pose a threat to the citizens of their own countries, which has prompted thousands to seek the security of our southern border. And it is a priority for the Department of State to use our available resources to improve these conditions. Responsible physical security and stockpile management practices reduce the number of illicit weapons available throughout the region and disrupt the criminal activities contributing to migration. So how is the conventional weapons destruction program helping to secure these weapons? In Latin America, we currently support physical security and stockpile management programs in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Ecuador, and Peru. Most recently, we began a regional project in the Caribbean through the United Nations Regional Center for Peace, Disarmament, and Development in Latin America and the Caribbean, or UNLIRAC. In this context, we are supporting the Caribbean community's efforts to implement the regional roadmap it adopted last year to combat illicit firearms trafficking. Additionally, our regional convention we conventional weapons destruction project in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras contributes to pillar four of the White House strategy to address the root causes of migration in Central America. Pillar four's goal is to counter and prevent violence, extortion, and other crimes perpetrated by criminal gangs, trafficking networks, and other organized criminal organizations. Our implementing partners throughout the region coordinate with U.S. embassies and partner nation governments to assist with the destruction of state-held excess or obsolete weapons and ammunition, provide physical security and infrastructure upgrades to vulnerable weapon storage facilities, and implement physical security and stockpile management and explosive ordnance disposal training opportunities to build the capacity of host nation security forces to continue responsible weapons management independent of U.S. assistance. In Latin America and globally, we have seen an increase in the prioritization of the request for physical security and stockpile management assistance from the United States, as the proliferation of illicit weapons supports nearly every aspect of the criminal economy. The United States continues to encourage the full and effective implementation of the UN Program of Action on the Illicit Trade in Small Arms and Light Weapons. Our assistance for physical security and stockpile management helps Latin American countries with their own implementation of the UN Program of Action. Our implementing partners in Latin America, like HALO and MAG, have worked to find innovative ways to assess and address the threat that vulnerable small arms and light weapons pose to the region. In 2020 and 2021 alone, despite the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, U.S.-funded efforts have resulted in the destruction of more than 400 tons of ordnance and 278,000 rounds of small arms ammunition. Despite the pandemic, U.S.-funded efforts also trained nearly 100 security forces personnel in physical security and stockpile management and explosive ordnance disposal. Additionally, we have seen the introduction of additional data-based assessments which increase collaboration amongst donors and provide information that can inform current and future U.S. conventional weapons destruction priorities. In addition to our physical security and stockpile management programming, the United States supports humanitarian demining efforts in Colombia, as landmines and explosive remnants of war threaten civilians in the aftermath of conflicts for decades after fighting has ended. Since 2001, the United States has invested more than $159 million 
to support Columbia's mine action sector by facilitating the survey of priority municipalities and clearance of high impact minefields, focusing on areas where such efforts coincide with planned development and stabilization projects. Additionally, the Interagency Manpads Task Force, in coordination with the Organization of American States, has recently launched a series of regional aviation security seminars, which address the threat manpads pose to assist foreign security officials at airports, border crossings, seaports, national police, and customs in their efforts to improve aviation security infrastructure, as well as counter proliferation efforts regarding these advanced weapon systems. In conclusion, the United States commitment to conventional weapons destruction in Latin America and the Caribbean continues to grow. Our commitment is grounded in over 25 years of bipartisan congressional and taxpayer support, combined with the experience and determination of our implementing partners. Together, we have worked with host governments as well as communities at the local level to create a resilient program that has evolved and adapted along with the threat from landmines, unexploded ordnance, small arms and light weapons, and related munitions. The American taxpayer can be proud of the assistance rendered to this part of the world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, uh, Representative Spears' office to uh, uh, manage our Q&A time. Great, thank you, Congressman. Uh, we're gonna have votes very shortly, but I would like to invite anyone who is um, listening to either put in the chat or raise their hands and we'll try and get your questions answered. Let me um, start off by, acting, by asking Director Chandler, um, what more should Congress do to support the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatements efforts in regard to weapons security? program specifically? To be honest, I think that the, the support that we have received and from the caucus um, has just been tremendous over the years. Um, we're tremendously grateful. Uh, there's, there is literally nothing else that we could ask for um, other than for you to continue to do what you and Representative Johnson are doing today, which is to, to highlight these issues um, for the American people so that they understand how the assistance that you're authorizing is being provided to these communities and how it helps the local population and the United States. So um, I think it was uh, Juan Manuel who talked about um, a lot of these weapons being um, housed right now or warehoused in various locations, particularly in Ecuador, I believe, um, that they, um, don't know what to do with. And it seems like um, there must be a means by which we can encourage them to dispose of them or, or pay to have them disposed. Um, maybe Juan Manuel can comment and then maybe uh, Director Chandler can comment as well. Yeah, uh, sure, Congressman, thank you. Yeah, the, the issue here is, is uh, especially in Central America, you have plenty of weapons that are found in crime scenes on a daily basis. Those weapons are transferred over to the military for, for safekeeping. But now in, in El Salvador alone, you've got more than 14,000 weapons that have been sitting there for more than 10 years, and they serve no purpose whatsoever. And meanwhile, these weapons can easily just walk out the door and go into the hands of criminals. Um, so we're in conversations with government. They are interested, they are interested in, in disposing of some of these weapons, but it's an effort that includes the attorney general, the judicial system, the military. It's a complicated process, but I do think perhaps uh, one avenue, and you just suggested it, uh, Congresswoman, is either you know, paying for some of these weapons to be destroyed or providing more support to increase armory uh, security, et cetera, let's say, um, to, to have them in exchange um, destroy more weapons. But but it is a problem because these are weapons that can just literally walk out of a huge arsenal out of 14,000 and, 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 you know, later turn up in, in a crime scene. You said some of the weapons. Is there a reluctance to dispose of all the weapons that have been um, retrieved due to criminal activity? Well, what, what happens, Congresswoman, is some of these weapons are still active in judicial cases. So you need them for legal purposes. Okay. But I would argue, uh, this is kind of a guess, but I would argue that a majority or at least half of those 14,000 are sitting there 
are, you know, they really have no purpose. But, you know, the Ministry of Defense says I can't destroy this unless the judicial system system allows me to. So, so there's an issue of communication and it's not necessarily lack of willingness. It's just a complicated process that I think if the U.S. were to get involved and, and push the envelope a bit more, it would probably be very helpful. All right. Um, Director, do you have any further comments? Um, no, I, I think that Juan Manuel has, has hit that very well. Um, it is it is a complex process to get the governments to allow these weapons to be released for destruction. And so one of the things that my office does is negotiate MOUs with the, with the host governments to explain how we can offer assistance to help better secure the weapons. Um, if they will allow us to destroy some of them. So it's a, it's a combination effort of trying to help them learn better stockpile management techniques, building them more secure facilities, and then also getting them to allow the, to the, um, getting them to agree to the destruction of, of the weapons as well. So uh, questions in the chat. Um, what do you think has a big, what do you think is a bigger problem in these countries? Is it physical security or a lack of inventory management and accountability? To the panelists. Maybe oh, Franz would like to start. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. I mean, both of those aspects are problems here, and each country is a different story, I would say. Uh, on one hand, most of these countries face budget constraints that doesn't allow them to have enough uh, physical security measures in order to prevent filtrations or diversions. And of course, there is a lack of knowledge in terms of how to inventory and manage weapons and munitions in a proper way. As said, I don't think there is like a specific answer for the reality of the whole region, but of course there is, or there are unmet needs in both of those scenarios or aspects actually. Any other comments on that question? Yeah, and, and in Central America, basically, it's an issue of lack of, of financing for upgrades, and, and it dovetails as well with the issue of just lack of technical capacity. You, you need to train these soldiers on how to store weapons and how to manage them. That, that's really uh, also the issue. Which um, goes to, an, I guess, another question. Do you think these programs could be effectively scaled up in your respective countries of operation or other countries in the region? Um, it sounds like it's just a matter of money. Is that the case? Yeah, in Central America, that's the case. We, we they definitely, we could scale up uh, operations. And it's really interesting, you know, uh, the U.S., the bilateral relationships are one thing. That's, we leave that up to the diplomats and, and the elected officials such as yourselves. But in, our, in my world, where I work with the Minister of Defense and the Minister of the Interior, et cetera, do a lot of these things, the Director of Police, the relationships are, are, really, are very solid and they actually enjoy working with us and they enjoy U.S. support. So um, politics aside, this is something that these countries really look forward to, to having, uh, uh, you know, supporting. All right. Um, this is a question for um, the director. Uh, you mentioned that another goal is to help these countries implement their own weapons management programs that they can run independently of the US. Could you elaborate on how that process is being facilitated? I would actually turn it over to um, MAG or HALO to be best placed to answer that because they have the experience of doing that on the ground. Um, but in general, in all of the assistance that we're providing, our goal is to be able to step back so that we don't have to continue to provide this assistance over and over again. So we're constantly looking to our implementing partners to implement programs in such a way that they're training the local officials to be able to carry over on this work. And so maybe Juan or Franz, maybe you'd like to elaborate on how specifically you do that. Mm -hmm. Franz, do you wanna go first or do you want me to? Sure, thanks. Uh, so for instance, I mean, I said sustainability is one of the key issues here because we have to increase our capacities in, in such a way that they can continue on their own once the cooperation is over. In that sense, each country has its own standards. However, we have to be aware that those standards have or are based on international standards as well. So therefore we can do something in order to teach them and improve their level. And even if there is any difference within the in-country guidelines they use, uh, we can help them towards building 
sustainable capacities. As specific examples, what we do, for instance, in Peru and Ecuador is to try to provide trainer to trainer courses in order to allow them to train their own people on future stages or to provide them not only with equipment for uh, security purposes, but with equipment for training purposes as well, so they can continue with their own uh, training or courseware when they go to that stage where they are ready to provide it on their own. It is not that they do not have any local training programs at all, but we can do a lot to enhance their capacity to scale up their training operations and to provide more sustainability within the scope of the project. Yeah, and, and, and I would just add to that that HALO uh, will be carrying out WEM, Weapons and Ammunition Management Baselines in El Salvador and Guatemala in 2022 with the help of India, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. And that's going to give us a baseline so we can better understand what, what gaps in capacity they, they have, these governments, the military and the police, so that we can create a curriculum uh, and a set of projects through PMWRA to support them uh, long term, four or five years years down down the road. And I think France is also correct. It's not that they don't necessarily have the capacity. I just I think sometimes they they wander off and they're not necessarily following international protocols. Uh, you know their curriculums are out of date. Uh, there's a lot we can do to support them so that we can bring them up to date and and also just have them focus on, on what really matters on, on weapons and ammunitions management. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of just lost a bit on, on the issues. Uh, and that's where we could step in uh, in a technical basis. All right, um, here's a, a good question. Uh, I ask it all the time. Uh, you have, uh, you know, China investing in countries around the world and their Belt and Road Initiative, and everyone knows about it. Um, here you have direct engagement with military and police. Um, and the question is, what can be done to increase visibility and awareness of this US funded assistance for the general population in these countries? We quietly go in, do good work and don't um, talk about it. So I don't know, um, Director Chandler, do you wanna try that one? Sure, um, and, and I appreciate it because it is something that we are, we are trying to focus on. Um, to counter the narrative that China has, which is that it's providing all sorts of infrastructure assistance to, to countries, um, but that comes at a cost to them, whereas the assistance that we are providing to save lives, literally, um, we, we do it very quietly and, and maybe do not get as much credit as we deserve for, and it comes at absolutely zero cost to the local population. It only helps them. One thing that we do is ensure that our implementing partners always have the American flag on the shoulder of literally every deminer that is out there in the field doing this work. Um, you see behind Franz and behind Juan, you see the American flag displayed very prominently with the local flag and with the organization's flag. We have US branding requirements as part of the grants that we provide so that it's very visible that this is American assistance that is being provided. In terms of how we promote that publicly, we also, um, every time there is a ribbon cutting ceremony or a, a large area that has recently been cleared and becomes mine impact free, we try to do very visible public ceremonies with high level officials, whether that means someone from the United States that's coming to visit, or with an ambassador um, at the local at the local U.S. embassy, um, who can go out and and make a big splash about what what the assistance that the U.S. government has just provided. And we recently did this uh, in Sarajevo when we announced with the along with the mayor of Sarajevo that the the city of Sarajevo had become mine impact free. Um, which was just a tremendous accomplishment 25 years after, after the Dayton Peace Accords were signed. So we do very much try to, we tweet about it, we do public blog posts about it, we do official events, um, but you know, you, you asked what you could do um, before, and I think the amount of support that we can get um, from all sorts of U.S. government officials and high-level elected officials like yourselves to help publicize this is always beneficial to America. So are, are, you said you're tweeting. So you are posting on Facebook and, and tweeting about these. I mean, every time there's you know a successful uh, project or a successful activity, 
you know, X number of guns uh, destroy. I mean, I would think that would be worth tweeting in the country. Are you doing that kind of thing? Yes, absolutely. We, um, if you if you were to to take a glance um, any day, if, if any one of the audience members wants to go to uh, the State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs Twitter feed, um, then you will see. Actually, very recently, we had some posts about the work that we've been doing in Ecuador. Um, and then again, we have that amplified by the local missions as well. So the lo the embassies in country will also do tweeting and Facebook um, entries about about the assistance that has been provided. Have there been local newspaper stories, TV stories that have been um, done about the work? I, I couldn't comment on TV, but definitely local news stories. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, one last question here, and then we're going to have to close because we're, a vote's been called. How many of these weapons that you're tracking can be traced back to the United States? Are you happy for me to, yeah, anyone? Uh, I, actually, but, uh, this is a, a rough estimate because we've done some research, but uh, roughly I would say it's anywhere from 30 to 40% of weapons wow. that are confiscated around there. Uh, I mean, I, I you know, I, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a rough estimate just from independent research. Uh, so uh, the amount, and then there are other countries like Brazil uh, that also have a, a chunk uh, of weapons uh, that are sold to Central American countries. So it just depends, it varies. So these, uh, do you think these are guns that are purchased from com commercial manufacturers in the United States or these are just gun running that, that goes on that ends up being? I, I personally could, I couldn't answer that. I, I just know the figures are, you know, US made are probably 30 to 40. So you haven't looked at, at serial numbers necessarily. Because that should tell you. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Franz, any thoughts? Yeah. From the Ecuador, I mean, uh, I think there's no such thing like a specific ratio of US weapons uh, or a homogeneous rate for the whole countries. As per the Ecuadorian experience, the ratio is a little lower than what Juan Manuel said. Uh, however, we have to think about that. Uh, a lot of the illegal weapons here in Ecuador are either handcrafted or diverse from, yeah, state-held stockpiles. And under that framework, the only ones that can be traced back to the U.S. is a little ratio from the part that is or was diverse from state-held uh, depots, let's say. So under that framework, uh, the ratio for Ecuador is a little lower. What we have found a lot is a lot of uh, handmade or handcrafted uh, weapons mm -hmm. and actually munitions as well, which is kind of dangerous, I would say. But yeah, it's long story short, it's a smaller ratio, I would say. Yeah, we have a problem in, in the United States with ghost guns. You can just buy all the parts. So I'm sure that's happening um, in these um, countries as well. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us and for all the good work that you do um, to keep people safe around the world. It's, it's really uh, quite remarkable and um, something that we're very grateful that you do. So thank you again.